hopefully that's better. So I'm going to assume in mute, uh, Drew, please uh, text Len to confirm that it's working. <laughs> anyway, it's great to great to be here. Uh, and, and as some of you know, um, I am currently unemployed, which is great. Um, it's sort of semi-retired, I would call it. Um, and, and, and for several reasons, not that one thing is I'm old. And as you're going to see, the, the, the presentation will have a historical um, sort of perspective on how things have evolved, uh, especially in relation to other things in our specialty and in our world, which have evolved at a different pace. So I think in, in, in particular, I think food allergy innovation has has experienced barriers that are um you know unlike anything i've ever seen i mean it's just ridiculous that it's that it's been several decades and and we're just now having a, a, some realistic options um anyway um uh, and uh, but i'm also happy because i have some perspective from having been employed in pharma for the last six years uh, or five and a half years at uh, immune therapeutics um and but I'm no longer employed by them, which means that at a CME venue, I can actually say things that um, are still compliant and and evidence based, but not representing a company. Um, and and so I personally, that's been a desire of mine. Um, and and so this is great. Anyway, so we're going to talk a bit about uh, FDA approved uh, treatments for food allergy and. Um, you will notice that this is going to be restricted to the ones that are FDA approved. So, um, and I'm happy to elaborate on any other ones that have been in development or coming in the future. And hopefully there'll be plenty of time at the end for some discussion. Now, if I can get this to advance, here we go. This is the word of the day, which I've told is a thing. Um, um, and as you can see, I'm still uh, I'm active doing stuff. I'm a consultant with FAIR, uh, which is an advocacy group. Um, and Stallergens Greer, which currently owns uh, Palforzio or the, the um, FDA approved oral immunotherapy for PINA that was uh, purchased a year ago. And Nestle Health Science, who, which is the other, the, the, the group that sold the, the asset, and then a couple of other uh, asthma um, things that aren't, aren't relevant and, and not uh, too time consuming. And the way I'd like to uh, proceed is. First, start with just some background information about the unmet need and the timeline of things, and then summarize the safety and efficacy data from the two FDA-approved treatments for for uh, a food allergy, um, and then talk about trouble the barriers or what went wrong. Um, and I would say, uh, with uh, first of all the FDA-approved peanut OIT, but then also omalizumab. When you might say, well, it hasn't had time to go wrong it's like well it has actually it's been on the market 20 years so there's been and we need to learn from that not not dwell on it too much but be aware of that perspective and try to do better moving forward um and then also some prospects for the future now does anybody know what this might be this is uh a figure in the new england journal uh from a new england journal that talks about threshold of peanut flour which is an oral food challenge um, before and after treatment uh, for uh, several months with something. Kind of looks like the omalizumab pivotal trial. Well, guess what? This was from 2003, which meant that this study was started um, in about 2000. So uh, remember when that was. Uh, those of you who were born <laughs> before then, uh, like me, uh, I, you know, this these were the days where I could... Uh, you know, I, I, this time of year with grass pollen season coming, I would spend half day in in uh, what was then called Asthma Inc. doing uh, overseeing clinical trials and race over the the lake to Redmond office uh, and in my Prius. It was a brand new type of futuristic car with no cell phone or or handheld internet or anything, and then uh, see ten patients and be done by five o'clock and just write these great notes. They had pre-printed scripts with every common thing that we ever prescribed. And this time of year, half the patients were getting their annual refill of Claritin. I mean, those are real things. I mean, so it was a much different life. Um, and the reason I bring that up is mainly just to illustrate how long ago that was, because, uh, and, and this, so this uh, 
technology was is not new. Uh, the the uh, anti IgE and that happened to be a molecule called Tanox nine hundred one, which is very similar to omalizumab, and and so that was a long time ago. Yeah, I have a slide on that, <laughs> and I had to be careful because I I tried to find things that were publicly available, so we didn't you know, speculate on something inappropriately. But but there is a comment from uh, a Novartis uh, annual report that I'll come to on that. But there, there was a, and it's an illustration of a barrier uh, in, in the innovation process leading to, to treatment that's available. But um, anyway, but great, great question. This slide, I won't spend a lot of time on. Suffice it to say, the unmet need of food allergy has exploded. When, when I started uh, at, at NAC and the year 2000, I, mean, I was seeing, for example, peanut allergy probably once or twice a week. Um, and then by the time I retired from practice at that, at, at, in 2018, I think, six, seven, eight a day, I mean, it was a much different ball game. And I'm an internist and I became basically a pediatrician based on the, the demographics of the referral base. So it's a, it's a um, remarkable explosion of an epidemic. Uh, and to me has become had become the unmet the, the number one unmet need in our specialty and it hasn't changed at all <laughs> with uh, FDA approved treatment and so this is that 25 year horizon uh, and and sort of a an estimation of what's happened with the unmet need over that same time point and and look remember in 2020 at, towards the end uh, there became a peanut allergy FDA approved treatment um, and there are a lot of off-label, you know, uh, prescription of of OIT and SLIT. Yet the unmet need hasn't hasn't relinquished at all. And you, and this is sort of a rough timeline. It shows the omalizumab phase two trial was initiated uh, after the Tanox nine hundred one was discontinued. Um, then there was this summit that was took place uh, in two thousand eleven, I believe, that this advocacy group called the Food Allergy Initiative put on. And this was in the in the in the wake of um, a handful of published controlled trials with oral immunotherapy for peanut, and um, I and many others were really skeptical of this uh, because it hadn't been done in in a proper way, and yet none of the pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, companies were interested in pursuing it, especially after the omalizumab um, phase two trial was discontinued because of a safety concern that that had nothing to do with omalizumab. Um, and so this this advocacy group, which is now called FAIR, concluded from the FDA, NIH, and thought leaders and community that, that there need to be a company formed to uh, produce uh, a, a um, clinical development program for oral immunotherapy to peanut. And that company was called ARC, Allergen Research Corporation, and they later changed their name to Amune, which then became Nestle, and now it's owned by Stallergen's Greer. So it's a, a long history. But that was back in 2012 that that company was formed. Um, then there was this, people forget that legalizumab, which I didn't, I could never remember the generic back then. It was this QGE031 um, that was this high affinity anti-IgE and 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 they were going to do it for peanut and I went to an investigator meeting for that um in fact Ashley was working in asthma Inc with with us at that point and there was a lot of this exciting stuff but then it got we'll come back to this but it, it it got discontinued before it got started um and then there was an FDA advisory committee meeting in 2016 that concluded that um double blind oral uh uh, randomized or double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge was the necessary primary endpoint to prove efficacy for FDA approval. And that was, you might say, well, of course, well, that's a big undertaking. I mean, this is a huge amount of overhead, especially at non-academic sites that don't have employees that are covered on grants and things. So it's a, and it can lead to the demise of a small business very quickly if it doesn't go as planned. Anyway, so that was that happened uh, in 2016. Meanwhile, trying to figure out what was going on in the market, 70% of the of you all, um, uh, the academy members, uh, concluded that they felt that 
OIT would be great only if it was FDA approved and they would integrate it in their practice. And I'll just say that hasn't happened. Um, and so the market research in retrospect was wrong. But on the other hand, um, it's a lesson that, you know, it takes so long to develop something, things change, you know, and, and there, it's not in a vacuum. Meanwhile, uh, the, the EPIT or the peanut patch was initiated um, at the same month that the food OIT or the peanut OIT was initiated. Um, and then in 2019, the omalizumab phase three, this time not by a pharmaceutical company, but in partnership with a comp uh, with Genentech to, and it was actually carried out by NIAD. So the NIH was actually doing the clinical pivotal trial, which is a, a very unusual um, thing for, for a common disease like this. So, um, but anyway, that saved it. And then in 2020, peanut OIT got approved. And then finally this year, omalizumab. So that's a bit of history. And and I think for those of you who are in training, you may not have known half of that from, from before, but it, it's a, a long um, uh, thing. So let's go quickly into the uh, a summary of the, the efficacy and safety, um, starting with the peanut allergen powder, DFNP, and this is the official generic of what's called palforzia. Um, and, we, and in our manuscripts or the manuscripts that were done that I was part of some of them, um, we refer to it as PETA, which I don't like, but that's what we'll be uh, um, referring to it as. Anyway, the primary outcome in age four to 17 is what's in the in the label now. And the middle bar is the, the ability to tolerate uh, 600 milligrams or more of uh, peanut protein after approximately one year of treatment. And to keep this in perspective, on average, the patients could tolerate no more than 10 milligrams at the baseline. So 100 fold change um, in uh, in the, if you go to a thousand, which is half of them, but that um, about two thirds could tolerate the 600. Um, a peanut is about 250 milligrams. So, and and it, it, what's also relevant is the, the, the best data we have suggests that the, the typical accidental exposure resulting in symptoms needing treatment is about half a peanut kernel or 125 milligrams. So that sort of puts it in perspective. Now, that's a wide variation. So you, some patients, it's two gram accidental exposure and some it's a, a tiny amount. But um, but I think on average, it, you, you need a bit of a, a pretty good efficacy to to really feel like your patient's being protected because a half a peanut kernel is, is, is more than a little bit. Um, anyway, so, uh, and then below is the, uh, what was published last year, the data in ages one to three, which is currently under review by the FDA to, to be approved. And we'll come back to this theme of the, that age group uh, for not just OIT, but anything being a, a critical window of opportunity for, for intervention. Anyway, so, um, and then just to, just to highlight uh, for each of the endpoints, the, the proportion of patients that could tolerate, um, uh, for example, the 600, the 1,000, and even 2,000, which wasn't in the 417 um, pivotal trial, uh, those numbers are quite high for the, for the toddler. So it's a, it, it was a very robust response. Um, and then this is the uh, going, diving even deeper um, into ages one, ages two, and ages three at the time of the start of treatment. And uh, you can see that, for example, um, for the 2,000 milligram, which is, whoops, let me go back, mess that up. Is that not working? Here we go. All right, the so 2,000 milligram, uh, you could see that uh, about, overall, it was 61.2% of patients that could tolerate handful of peanuts, basically, a meal-sized portion of peanuts for that age group. And in the age one to two, and they, these were equally distributed among the age groups, it was 72%. So it was a, a very high proportion uh, uh, in that group, and very few of the placebo patients um, did that. So this is sort of in the face of the recently published um, uh, Health Nuts study that actually this month, uh, they published an update of, in Australia of kids saying that 33% of patients with confirmed peanut allergy will outgrow it. This did not happen. <laughs> there was zero that, that 
tolerated this. And the impact trial, which uh, NIAD did, also had a very, very low. So it's a, it's a matter of who your patients are that you're that you're following, I think. And and so this is really important to take home. Um, whoops, it's going the wrong way. Oh no, this is safety. Yeah. So look at the age four to seventeen, and and I think it's important to summarize the safety here. And and I didn't uh, define all the abbreviations, but treatment, emergent adverse events, GI adverse events, GI adverse events leading to discontinuation. And you can see that um, a lot of patients had adverse events. These are there was a year long study, um, and, and and the vast majority had even GI adverse events, if, at least transient and generally mild, but the ones that led to discontinuation, it was 6.5% of patients that couldn't, uh, that, that discontinued due to GI adverse events. Um, and uh, systemic allergic reactions, uh, which we all um, are familiar with from SCIT and other things, it was 14.2%, which is a, a bigger number than was expected. Although the good news is it was primarily mild and moderate um, reactions, um, the 0.3% had severe and severe leading to discontinue or systemic reactions leading to discontinuation, it was 1.9. So there were some people that stopped because they had a several, uh, just sort of like with skip several reactions that say, look, this isn't a good treatment. Um, anyway, and then ages one to three, though, much different. Um, the G adver GI adverse events was fewer than half. Uh, there was, and about half as many uh, uh, would discontinue because of GI. Systemic reactions were actually the same with um, uh, active as placebo with in, in the age one to three, and there were no severe reactions, no uh, what, no discontinuation due to systemic reaction. So there was a fair amount of epi use, and in both groups, you can see the placebo has quite a bit of epi use too. And in our country, the we use epi pretty freely uh, for various things. And when you look at individual cases, they were mostly tree nut exposures or whatever that that were kind of not, it actually wasn't related, at least it wasn't judged to be related by the investigator. Although clearly there's there were more um, instances in the treated group. Anyway, yeah, yeah. I think it's toddlers spitting up or whatever. You know, I mean, I mean, or 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 crying because you're giving them something and they don't get to choose. Or I mean, I don't know. But it, there, there's there. It was oatmeal basically. I mean, it's not. It wasn't a a. Uh, there's no no reason to to expect that there was a physiologic um, thing that in the placebo that was responsible. I think, but that's why it's important to do these trials and 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 look at the the placebo epi use. That was a six point five percent in this you know uh, one hundred twenty four patients is a lot um, more than we would think. But these it also I didn't have time to go into the demographics, but these are patients. The, the average specific IgE for the 4 to 17 group was 80, you know, going into the trial. And they had more than half had multiple al uh, food allergies and more than half had eczema, more than half had asthma. So this, these were kind of uh, the people who would just, oh, there's a clinical trial. And and so we had no trouble filling the clinical trial. I was an investigator with this and, and, and it was... Um, clearly the throughput in the clinic that was or in the in the research center that was the problem uh in terms of or the rate limiting step for recruitment we could have recruited 100 patients if we wanted to but the ones with the most uh severe disease the ones that that would that would gravitate to the studies yeah i mean whenever there's the scrutiny of a you know so one thing that's really important to realize is that especially when data, when we're making decisions based on the quality of the data, if it's a pivotal trial, the quality of data is really good. And they have, and the companies have an army of people to make sure that everything's being done right. And they'll audit your site and, 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 and seemingly trivial things end up being a big deal. Um, whereas you just publish a little study on your own, 20 patients. And then you, the fact that it's published doesn't mean that it's, fact um that the, the conclusions and so i think 
the relative certainty of the uh, um, you know uh, generalization of the result is really important to keep in mind. Um, anyway, so moving along, this I won't spend much time on this just to show that that uh, the, the OIT uh, in in this group there was a long term uh, follow up at open label, and you can see that that both the portion of so most of the adverse events are in the first year or two of treatment. Um, the light blue is the treatment related adverse events. Okay. So, and that goes very low after two years. So it's a, into the third, fourth year. So it's a, um, so this is a lot like skit, you would think, um, in terms of what we'd expect. And, and that was, um, nice to see. And th these are the individual symptoms that we, that were the most common, um, that were reported and most of them are GI and, and they settle down quite a bit after the first year. Hey, Steve, is it possible for you to repeat the question so we can hear on Zoom? Survival bias, right? Yeah, no, this is the obvious question. I'm glad you asked, asked it. Um, that was what I assumed. But then when you look at who discontinued um, and the reasons for their discontinuation, the um, in the first year, it was about 11% who discontinued due to adverse events. And remember, the most common reason was GI, about 6.5%. And then, and then next was, I think, uh, uh, systemic reactions at 1.9%. So 11%. In this group, the full thing, 13%. Total. It included the 11%. So it really was not the main reason why people didn't stay in the study. There were a lot fewer patients out of five years. But, um, I mean, people got tired of it. They changed to peanut M&Ms. They didn't want to be in a study anymore. Why? Why mess with it? I mean, if they, especially if they could tolerate two thousand milligrams with no symptoms, they were thinking. Mean, I think there was a lot of second guessing uh, of why they would want to be still in a study when their kid was starting to get on soccer teams and 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 all these things. They, and it's hard enough figuring out the time of day to give the dose, let alone whether you you take time out of school to come for a clinic visit or whatever. So I think that was so. So withdrawal of consent was the why far and away the most common reason for discontinuation. But it's an excellent point and something, that, and this was not pivotal trial anymore. So, so we have to be, take that for um, what it's worth, but it was encouraging. And I think similar to what we see with, with Skit. And this, I think I'd like to just draw your attention, first of all, to the, the Y axis. So we had to, for this, uh, the other, for reference, so this one goes from zero to 0 0.3 in the Y axis. The previous slide it goes from zero to ten. So, so we had to inflate it to show the, and this is um, anaphylactic reactions or systemic reactions of any severity. Um, and you can see that they persist at this, it, what is a fairly low level, but it's nevertheless real uh, for a couple of years before it starts to come down. So it's not, um, you know, like skit where once you get to the maintenance dose, things. Yeah, you know, that GI adverse events, that's the case. But with systemic reactions, it sort of persists, but then it, it sort of decreases after that, um, which is encouraging. Um, and then you can see the severe ones, which were almost always because the patient went and exercised after the dose, uh, are very rare. Um, and uh, and usually don't, I mean, they're scary, but they end up staying on usually uh, by choice. So it's an interesting phenomenon. So let's, in the interest of time, oops, go to uh, the omalizumab. And and Sharon, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I have another section. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I planted him for these questions. But um, so, uh, anyway, but I wanted to go through the the pivotal trial data and and the and what we know about the the these uh, products um, and why why what it takes to get approved. Um, and and this was just reviewed two weeks ago here, or three weeks ago, with Sharon Shintraja, uh from Stanford, who is the last author on this New England Journal paper. Um, and those of you that were at the Academy and saw the presentation, this was like, I mean, we're talking standing ovation. And, and it was like, really? <laughs> it was amazing. Um, I, I've only seen this once in my career at the Academy, and that was when Gideon Lack presented the prevention data for from the LEAP study. Um, and that just, I digress a little bit, but by the way, that was more, 10 years ago and there's still no evidence of uh, reducing the the 
the unmet need of peanut allergy um the epidemic still growing so there's barriers to implementation of that as well so anyway i digress but this these are the primary and secondary outcomes uh, remember with this study all patients needed to be allergic to peanut and two other things so and it didn't really matter what the other two things were um and on the left, you can see uh, the primary endpoint was the ability to tolerate 600 milligrams, which is similar, the same number in the same challenge sequence um, as with um, the FDA-approved OIT. So, and you can see it was 67%, so about two-thirds similar to the um, primary outcome. That's where it ends. The, the Elizabeth hovered for everything, not just peanut, obviously. It's, a, it's allergen agnostic. Um, though, like with cashew, not quite as good. Um, and I'm sorry, this thing's in the way. I'm, I'm sure there's a way I can get this out of the way. We can see cashew is the second one, then egg, and then and then others. So it it uh, and it's so relative to placebo, it wasn't even close. But it wasn't um, completely the same for each. Um, and then this is a sort of on the on the. Uh, let's see if I can get this out of the way here. How's that? <laughs> Better. Um, on the left, you can see the oral the exit challenge starting at 0 0.1 milligrams, going all the way up to two consecutive doses of 2,000. So it's a huge six gram sort of dose if you could make it that far. And you can see this was a tremendous uh, effect. I mean, it was it was not even. Oops. There we go. So excellent efficacy on average for peanut. I mean, and and that was. Uh, I think part of why there was a standing ovation and all that. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is there were no, more than just a couple patients that didn't respond at all um, or just didn't get to. And this was, in fact, 14% couldn't tolerate even more than one tenth of a peanut. So that, so, and I think that having done a bunch of these trials, I mean, some patients have false positive uh, double blind placebo controlled food challenges. I mean, they, have anxiety that day or whatever, and you call the challenge positive because you don't know. Um, but it's not 14%. There, there, that's usually a couple percent that that fall into that category. Um, and so there's something about this, and the Tanox trial had the same thing. So we know that there's a very small proportion, but but real, that that is not responsive, and we don't know why, and we don't know who they are when you see them, unless you do an oral challenge. Um, so to summarize the efficacy and safety of omalizumab, broadly efficacious. Um, they didn't demonstrate any quality of uh, life changes uh, in the trial, and that was one of the secondary outcomes. I believe it causes an improvement in quality of life. I, I think the instruments aren't validated for that, for, for measuring treatment over time. And guess what? When you have a patient's visit and you're doing a, a quality of life survey, you do it when they come in right at the end of the trial, which is 10 minutes before they get an oral challenge, and they didn't know whether they were on placebo for the previous four months or five months. So it's a so the quality of life is bad on that day, and so I, I think that's a major problem with uh, that that outcome. And it's the most important outcome for food allergy because we're not trying to yes we're trying to prevent death, but it's the number needed to treat to prevent prevent one death would be you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands, and and it's the quality of life day to day that's the the big unmet need. Anyway, so but, but nevertheless, the the this so that's a barrier. We need we need better instruments to measure this. Um, and then the open label extension majority efficacy was was sustained through uh, almost a year, which was great. Um, and but then there were about one out of five that actually did worse um, after the from the sixteen to twenty weeks, which is the first endpoint, to forty to forty four weeks, which was the second one. So again, we're not sure why. Um, the safety is very easy. It's really, even though, regardless of what the label says, I mean, and it's important to know about anaphylaxis and malignancy and the patients need to be um, informed of that and make their own decisions. But we've had it on the market for 20 years. We, we know that, that patients generally do well. And in the outmatch trial, placebo and active were, were indistinguishable safety-wise. All right. So now I'm circling back to the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
an anomaly at one point in the history of your life? What's your experience on that? Well, I mean, I've, my main experience has been as a prescriber, and and that most of us were um, sort of annoyed and amused when that came because we knew that um, compared to other treatments, that <laughs> anaphylaxis was not that big a deal typically. I mean, it does occur on rare occasions, but I mean, these are patients that. Um, are well informed and 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 the outcomes were fine, um, but it was very rare, and I've not seen it in my experience. Um, and in fact, what I have seen is patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis generally a, a dramatic improvement. So it's a paradoxical uh, observation. And so I think the FDA sees its role as just the facts, and these facts come in just like um, suicide and um, singular, right? I mean that came out as like gee, how many of these have I caused over the last 10 or 15 years? And then now we counsel patients about that. And that's probably a real thing that in terms of mood disturbance or whatever, but it, it doesn't prevent prescribing it. It, 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 it. it makes sure that you don't forget to mention that. Um, or if somebody's depressed, you might think twice about it. So it's a, I think of it the same way. Um, and it's a matter of risk of not doing it versus the risk of doing it. Um, so it's on the label, so it needs to be discussed, but it, it just hasn't panned out in, in, in 20 years is a really good track record. Um, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The question was in the 14% who did not respond in the Zoller, in the outmatch trial, was the nature of their anaphylactic reaction GI? And the answer is, I don't think it was reported. In fact, one phenomenon that's really important that I didn't have time to go into is not just the threshold change, but the severity of the reaction during the challenge, um, because which are different. And 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 with OIT, when you're using the allergen, it it attenuates everything. Um, it does. It's not a cure, but it 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 the patients that reacted it. For example, a thousand milligrams at um, with with uh, the FDA approved product for OAT um, had very mild symptoms or no severe symptoms even at a thousand milligrams. With uh, omalizumab, we don't know. I mean, I don't I don't recall that it's been that it was reported to that with that granularity. There hopefully will be subsequent post talk reports that that do explain that. But it's a good question, and and if if you're driving it well. Is there a, maybe a way to predict? And there might be the, a lot of the, what's being discussed is potentially dose that 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 it's that that tried and true dose uh, table may not be the right table for for all patients. And this is one of the reasons it's great to be in a CME platform because I would never be able to say that <laughs> for uh, Genentech, and um, because that's not been studied uh, in a or published. Uh, but there is some some uh, elements of some of the studies that suggest that there may be a, uh, a too low of a dose. And in fact, with the legalizumab for Pino, which I'll get to, I think they just terminated a trial this year. Uh, and I think the plan is to change the dose and then restart it. So they're not giving up on it. Um, anyway, so there's a, a lot to, to learn still. Um, but let's talk about uh, the, again, bouncing back to FDA approved peanut OIT, PETA, what went wrong? And I put it into chapters because it was more than one thing went wrong with this. One uh, was concerns about safety. I don't know if, how many of you know, have heard of the PACE study, which uh, was in the Lancet in 2019, very strategically uh, published. And it was done thoroughly, but hastily uh, under a time pressure because they knew that the, the, uh, PETA FDA advisory committee meeting was coming up. And, and this was a meta-analysis where they looked at all of the peanut OIT studies in the literature um, and uh, and looked for what they called anaphylaxis, which is what I would call systemic allergic reactions of any severity. And, um, and they found 12 trials with 1,041 study patients. A lot of those patients were because of the pivotal trial with, with the approved treatment. Um, but this was before it was approved. And 
uh, Bob Wood, uh, many of you have heard of, uh, he may have been, been out here to speak at some point um, at Johns Hopkins. He has, it's well known, he has peanut allergy and he's very happy with avoidance. <laughs> and he was president of the academy at the time and he was very worried that this would be over prescribed. And, he, and, and uh, so anyway, just as a little editorial. And this is, um, you know, a summary of the studies. Um, what I would point out is that most of these studies on the left red thing are in the first year of treatment. Remember, first year of treatment is when the when the the, uh, the most uh, systemic reactions happen. Um, and he didn't discriminate based on severity. Um, and then again, some of the trials, or almost all the trials, were also more than three hundred milligram maintenance, which is the the approved one. And um, so anyway, it was it was he knew the result when he did it, which is if you compare the first year of OIT with avoidance, in other words, patients in the real world who um, are, are taking their chances, um, there's going to be more systemic reactions in that. And that was the bottom line. And I'll just say the trade name, palforzia causes more anaphylaxis than it prevents. <laughs> and that was latched onto, and that was harmful to at least the subset of patients who would be a good match um, because it, it, it wasn't even mentioned to them. Yeah, uh, in many cases. Um, so, anyways, it was kind of interesting. And this was published this year, um, which is a real-world safety experience post-marketing surveillance. Where the I'll just say, as a summary, that the in the real world, it seems to be a, a lot lower um, percentage than the fourteen percent that's in the label. Um, anyway, so chapter two: um, burden of prescribing, and I think this is the big chapter. Okay, um, the burden on the, the healthcare provider and the patient, updosing logistics. It's not like shots where you can, it's similar to shots in some ways, but it's not like shots in that you can't just delegate the entire thing and then go about your day. You can you have to be involved at some level and see the patient and make a decision of whether there's an updose. Uh, so every two weeks updosing for about six months, um, the initial dose escalation is about a four hour visit. Um, so that's a, those are considerable logistics, especially in this day and age. The, um, well, let me go back to the, there, specialty pharmacy distribution. So Amun chose this specialty pharmacy as the only way you can get your hands on this. And it turns out that was okay for the average small uh, business, small private practice, which is still, it's a shrinking proportion of the allergy being practiced now, but it's still the majority, I think, are small businesses. But it sort of forgot about academic centers um, who were some of the important investigators and big champions of this treatment and felt like they could do it safely. And in fact, it's still not approved at UW um, by the pharmacy because technically going from the manufacturer to a freestanding specialty pharmacy and then back to a hospital pharmacy is a violation, or at least a, a soft violation of JCO. So it it can be overcome and has been at almost everywhere. But but it took a year or two um, for the average academic center lead pharmacist to realize, oh, okay, we can do this. Um, and then um, anyway, so that was a big hurdle, and and uh, some things are being done to to um, make that better. Uh, but suffice it to say would have done it differently <laughs> in retrospect. And, he, and buying and buying bill wasn't an option back then. Um, is it, everybody probably, does people know what a REMS is? I, I never even heard the term before um, I joined Immune. And that case study that I showed was the catalyst for uh, a huge discussion at the FDA advisory committee and uh, meeting and the decision by the FDA to, to impose a, what's called a risk evaluation mitigation strategy, um, which is a it meant to to protect patients. So it's, I don't want to make it sound like it's a a bad thing because it's not, but it's a it's a huge logistical hurdle, and um, and the, the structure chosen was not easy to follow. Um, um, for uh, uh, so it, it requires that each provider get certified. One time and it takes two minutes that's not a big deal each healthcare facility that is going to prescribe it be certified and again it's a it's a web-based thing that you just agree that you're going to report the anaphylaxis and watch them for an hour after a dose and those kinds of things 
um, and that they will have epinephrine. I mean, it, it's not that onerous. Um, and then the patient and family need to also certify. So that's a that's a one time thing. That's I don't think the the death blow. But the bad part was every updose you have to physically call on the phone and ask, you know, if you can go to the next. And especially pharmacy determines whether they'll get released the next dose. And it's like, really? We're allergists. Why should we do this? So that that's being um, simplified as we speak. But that this was a major barrier. For example, if there was a half hour or an hour or 90 minute wait on hold with a specialty pharmacy, which has happened. So that was not good. Anyway, um, COVID. California approved January 30th, 2020. It had 80 uh, field uh, commercial field representatives trained in February and, and the, the launch in March and 48 hours later, national lockdown. And there was one patient that actually got put on <laughs> treatment, Brian Vickery's site in Atlanta. Um, and then that was it for months uh, and because we, we nobody knew how long this was going to last. Um, so that didn't help. Um, so you, and you wonder. You thought your clinics were under strain, but this was a company with no revenue that had pro projected revenue to feed families of those 80 people and others that were hired for it. But um, anyway, but then since then, and, and during during COVID, there was clinic strain, uh, clinics just trying to survive. They, I mean, not let alone just integrate a new treatment into their practice. Um, and then post COVID, there's a different culture uh, in terms of the the go to highly trained staff that can do everything and and take pride in this i'm not saying that they don't exist they're not it, they're they're just it's just not as as uh not the good old days anymore as far as that goes so um and i'm i don't know in seattle exactly how it's working but that's kind of nationwide how it's been um chapter four unapproved oit and and we'll just talk about peanut oit since there's uh hard to to um speak when there's no other other foods approved yet um so this was pioneered uh simultaneously and independently by both academic centers like wesley burks and others um and private practices like jim baker who's in oregon who was up here and and there's there's a uh, what was a small cohort of of pioneers uh, around the country doing it on their own way uh and uh multiple case series published using this gross grocery store source peanut protein. Um, and however, <laughs> this is where the polarization comes in. According to the FDA, when used in OIT to treat allergic individuals, products traditionally considered foods are biologics regulated by the FDA's, or regulated by CBER. So that's the justification for why the FDA thinks it needs to be approved. When, and this is a little off the cuff here, but when asked directly, one of their head, people about this I said well what say you couldn't there was no approval what would you be afraid of he said up dosing um and the point is that that if you're uh, and i'll come to this but the 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 uh potency of the component allergens is not uniform um in when you source it from the uh, from the growers or in in a food uh, base whereas uh, and i'll show you some data on that um, there are also pro-con debates at the academy and college during the development program, typically Richard Wasserman versus Bob Wood, um, and it was kind of entertaining. Um, and uh, and then in 2017, the college and the academy agreed to not promote anything that was unapproved uh, for food allergy, um, which is interesting. Uh, and that, I think, still exists, but sort of reluctantly, because there's a strong lobby within each to, to uh, stay out of the way. And, and yeah, so so the there are a variety of sources you can get peanut. Um, the the most the the biggest uh, grower uh, and provider of, of peanut food is called the Golden Peanut and Trina Company, and and Immune signed an exclusive agreement with them to provide peanut flour, which goes undergoes a lot of food G, uh, GMP uh, standards, but it doesn't, it isn't analyzed for um, allergen potency. And the, and it's more relaxed in terms of its contamination with mold like that, that produces aflatoxin. So it's a, 
So it's a uh, it's a less it's not a pharmaceutical grade, obviously. Um, so immune would source it from them, and then as all companies have, they called it CMC, so um, uh, manufacturing and pharmacology. I mean, it's all it's 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 a critical army of people behind the scenes that make sure your drug product is um, what you say it is, and it's not contaminated, and it lasts for as long as it says on the label. All of those things have been proven very carefully before anything gets to the market. And um, so it turns out the FDA was, they, they wanted to make sure there were immunodominant allergens were uniform. And as you can see on the left, the RH1, uh, 2, and 6, when analyzed in, in different lots of palforzia, um, this is this represents the lots that that made it, but the majority didn't make it. And the, uh, for example, RH one is very volatile in its um, um, uh, quantity in in different times of the year, different years with the climate and whatnot. And and so um, you might say, well, that's isn't RH two the most important? Yes, <laughs> and and most patients, this is probably doesn't matter too much. But we don't know the the perfect storm of when it might when it when it will matter, and I I kind of think of it more like a uh, a seatbelt in a car or an airbag in a car, where like how many how many how big does the end have to be before it's worth scrutinizing this? And um, so uh, anyway, more to follow on that. And Amune did a bad job of uh, it, it took till twenty twenty two to get this in the literature. Um, but the so the point is here that the the peanut flour that you get over the counter um, or an Amazon or whatever, PB2, which is often used, and Palforzia are not the same. I'm not saying that Palforzia is definitely safer, but I think that discussion needs to be open. We need to raise the bar of the discussion so the patients know that and, and they can make an informed decision. Um, anyway, so, and then on the right is the just year on year, on year um, um, aflatoxin um, and the 4.0 parts per billion is the pharmaceutical grade cutoff. And so that was the second leading reason for reject rejecting lots of, of the peanut flour. Um, okay. So what about omelizumab? Well, here's our friendly unmet need thing. And I'm going to try to finish up so we can have some questions. Talked about the Tanox two, 2003, the phase two trial that Genentech did that was shut down. We actually had it approved at Children's IRB. Um, and then they shut it down after there was some uh, oral food challenge, uh, severe, like near fatal reaction. So it was like too too early. <laughs> um, and then this legalizumab trial in 2011. Then in 2019, NIAD initiated the pivotal trial that led to its current approval. Um, legalizumab phase three for peanut was also initiated. Um, and then in this year, that both... Uh, legal, uh, legalizumab was terminated. Um, though, as I said, I think they're going to circle back later and omalizumab was approved. So again, a long timeline. This is the 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 quote that I mentioned I uh, was going to have, which is in, it's, it's in the Novartis annual report that talks about Genentech, Tanox, and Novartis finalizing a collaboration. That makes it sound like it was all really friendly. <laughs> and, and as far as I know, it was, but um, and then, uh, then eventually in 2007, um, Genentech purchased or acquired Tanox. So there is no Tanox anymore. And I don't know what that molecule is doing or what it's called at this point. Anyway, so that sort of explains, it was more of a political and economic thing. And, and I don't second guess, I mean, this is our system of innovation in terms of incentive and, and, uh, pharma, you know, the the medical uh, or the clinical development they need to just make this critical decisions about things so again i don't want to be beating up too much on them but it it wasn't good for patients to ha have a 20 year span like that um so what about opportunities and challenges for omalizumab it's the first approved biologic for uh, for food allergy it's allergen agnostic which is it should be celebrated uh has robust efficacy and a long history of safety uh, there's basically any human that's got food allergy that's reached their first birthday is eligible, which is kind of new. Um, we we are familiar as allergists with prescribing lo logistics, and it does have potential for combining with OIT. And so this is a, you know, I won't go into a lot of it, but but it uh, it could 
help uh, avoid the burden of the, the updosing. Oops, sorry, let me go one more back. Um, and, however, there is no disease modification as far as we know. In 20 years, we know a lot, and we, do, and we don't think that it does anything to change the trajectory of uh, any allergic disease when you stop it. Um, and so the key is, well, can you immunomodulate while you're under the protection of it and then enjoy that long-term benefit? Happy to talk about that. Um, not all patients respond, as we mentioned. Um, you have to do an old challenge until we have a better biomarker because obviously the, the totally IgE doesn't change. Um, and then there may be barriers uh, just because it's an injection, but albeit smaller barrier probably than, than coming in for updosing for six months. Um, now, prospects for the future is misleading because I'm not going to talk about wonderful new innovations on the horizon, but I, I want to focus a little bit more on this toddler um, age group for just a few minutes. Um, there was a trial called the IMPACT trial that, that ITN did, Immune Tolerance Network. Um, and this was started a long time ago. It was published uh, in 2022. This was in toddlers and just peanut allergy using a higher maintenance dose, so 2,000 milligrams. And one of the primary outcomes was remission, where they, after two and a half years, stopped the OIT and, and allowed no exposure to peanut for six months, which now would be malpractice probably, but because we now know we shouldn't do that. Um, and, and then they did the challenge again. And so the primary outcome was being able to tolerate 5,000 milligrams after being off OIT for six months. So that was a pretty high bar. Um, and this is a, basically shows the probability of being able to tolerate that five grams after the six months of avoidance. Um, with red being uh, the probability lower than 50% and blue being the probability that above 50%. And you can see that both age and baseline specific IgE are the predictors of whether they would undergo remission. And in fact, um, age at screening uh, less than two years and specific IgE 10 or less, it was 80%. But even 20 or 25 or 30 was the vast majority it would still be achieving remission. But once you get greater than 100, maybe, maybe not. And, and this is, this is um, to me, one of the, the, the ideas of sense of urgency. Um, and then from the, you would think, but it was only 2% in the, in the uh, impact trial that outgrew it. So this is, but that's a good, I mean, yes, I'm, it is the one, and the, the, the article that came out in allergy this, this month, that of the one in three that outgrew it, they tended to more often that they were low at baseline. The question is, do you wait and take your chances? Like how many, I mean, I could just tell you, I probably had, and Ashley, you tell me too, but of patients where you got a specific IgE for peanut and it was five or 10 or whatever, and then you repeat it two years later and it's greater than a hundred. And then you look at the parent in the eye and say, well, Sorry, <laughs> I don't think this is going to go away. Yeah, and I think that that assumption is is being borne out by these data. But the question is, you know, it's a kind of a helpless feeling. And and if the safety is there for you, you know, for omalizumab and doing OIT or doing OIT by itself, you know, would you would that be a better fit for, a, you know, more than half of one percent of patients, which is what's getting it now? I mean, it's a it's amazing. Um, anyway, and this is the last data slide, which is just showing, and all I want you to look at is the gray. So it has nothing to do with the actual drug product, but actually what happens on placebo. And this is the first trial that included a full 33 patients that hadn't turned two yet. So it was equally a number uh, between age two, age one, age two, and age three. And you can see below age three, the, the they started lower and they ended higher in that just that one year of the study. The, the uh, specific IgE was much higher by the end, whereas once they were three, it started higher and it stayed that way. So this is sort of, um, even though it wasn't part of the study design, this was also seen in the impact trial. And, and so we think it's a real thing. I've seen it anecdotally in practice. So um, anyway, so I think that's in the future, we will be thinking of different uh, ages. The more we learn, the more heterogeneous food allergy is. Um, and one special category would be 
you know, the phenotypes uh, earlier in life and whether they're they're ripe to be changed and, and maybe deserve a different treatment. So in summary, uh, the unmet need continues to expand despite two treatments, although one of the most recently approved, we hasn't really had a chance yet, so we'll, we'll reserve judgment, but I'm still, I just, there's something about food allergy things aren't moving so <laughs> um and then uh, no currently approved food allergy treatments are ideal though we're moving towards an expectation of treatment and so once i think par parents um uh, and children become you know that there's an expectation of a treatment they may not choose to do it but at least um it's it's better than than saying avoidance is fine um and uh there's significant barriers and we need we need to address these barriers so I think that's it. Oh, and the word of the day is prescribed. Yeah, <laughs> which I was told have to be in the talk. So, so we still have. Oh, only 